Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Covenant Cast, where we discuss the past, present, and future of the tabletop gaming industry. I'm Zach. And I'm Steven. And today we're introducing a very special series called The Power Seven, which is the seven mechanics in card games specifically that we've seen throughout these years that you got to be very careful with. So we have teamed up with a number of great designers, and we've got seven thrilling episodes coming your way following this one. And today we're going to be introducing the series, talking about those seven mechanics, and giving you an idea of the designers that you should expect to hear from over the coming weeks. So we hope you'll stay tuned. The Power 7. I'm ready to get into this. That's we've, right. We've uh, we've been behind the scenes. It's been like doing double time uh, because we've been doing podcast after podcast after podcast, keeping up the regular podcast schedule while getting six or seven of these things in the tank. Yeah. Was uh, I felt like we were just podcasting basically every day. There, there was a lot of a lot of casting to be done. We, so we, what we've we've done is we've uh, spent the last couple of months recording uh, a number of episodes of the podcast, the Power Seven podcast series that you're about to hear, and uh, it's been great. We've had a number of great conversations about these mechanics, and it's something we've been wanting to do for a long time. We originally were thinking like you know the Seven Deadly. Uh, titling, which is kind of where this idea started. And then we found out through uh, lovely community members from Discord that there were some other Seven Deadly series floating around out there. And uh, we didn't want to necessarily compete and, and kind of muddy the waters on on what these series were about. So we switched to the Power Seven, of course, a great allusion to things that we know very little about, uh, <laughs> which is Magic the Gathering. I think Important the Power Nine, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so here's what we're doing. Here's here's the mechanics. Let's just lay this out. I want to get these on the table. And um, this came from the How to Run a Game idea. Um, so we're nesting it into that series. And it's funny because it's not really, it's not a negative thing. How to Run a Game is a pretty provocative titling, but it's really not uh, this kind of like, ah, beware, your, your game's going to tank. For the Power 7, it's just be careful. Watch out for these. We've seen this in pretty much every game that we've played these things coming to the fore. And so just the basic list in no particular order, so everybody can start thinking about this out there mm -hmm. listening. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, things like silver bullet cards. That's one uh, obvious one. We've got resource cards, uh, which is uh, so many good examples of this in games. But the idea that resources are coming from your main draw deck and what that leads to in uh, basically gameplay. We've got the memory tax, which we covered a little bit in the How to Run a Game series previously, that random access memory idea. Um, but it's basically about stacking effects, about unlimited board states, basically a game where there's the potential for enough information to get on the board that keeping track of all of it is critical to actually making good decisions in the game. We've got, uh, who could forget, recursion. Mm. The uh, For me, maybe the most glaring number one thing to keep an eye on. We've got denial effects, uh, which we lumped in, uh, prevention, cancels, even healing to some degree, that uh, you got to watch out for those. We've got limit one as mm. a balancing mechanic. You love to see Boy, it. We've seen that a, a many times, haven't we? Uh, Warhammer Conquest immediately comes to mind for me on this one. Uh, and then finally, we've got free, in quotation marks, <laughs> just simply free. Uh, something that, man, if you, you're in the Discord currently and you're you're talking about any game, uh, Zach or I have probably uh, regaled the, uh, the the sadness of free and what it means to to a game and to a card, and sent some warning lights on the text that anytime says reduce cost by X, or this card is free if you do Y. Uh, so watch out for those. So those are the seven, the power seven mechanics. And just to have an idea of what's going on before we dive into kind of a, a brief summary of each of these, we've got MJ Newman, we've got Nick Conley, we've got Isaac Vega, we've got Alex Day, we've got Lucas Lissinger, we've got Justin Gary, some great names, some great designers that we've worked with and talked to many times over the, the, the past X years. Um, and so we're going to be joined by each of them for one episode, about an hour long each talking about one of these mechanics, also talking about a quick rundown of the other mechanics. And honestly, having recorded all of these interviews, it is fascinating 
how different some of the perspectives are on each one of these yeah. and, and the diversity of opinion on what kind of effects should or shouldn't exist and how to be careful with those, how to counterbalance those kinds of things. Uh, so we've got a wild ride ahead. And then, of course, on uh, one of the mechanics, Zach and I are going to uh, take the enlightened approach of recording our own episode, speaking and thinking like designers ourselves, having now learned from six big brains in the industry, uh, we're going to approach the free mechanic as the finale of the episode and talk about the pluses and minuses and be probably less uh, fanatical about certain things because uh, you can't help but soften some views when you hear good perspectives on on other uh, takes yeah. of one, mechanical balance. One of the more interesting bits uh, going through this, so each, each episode will have a designer and there'll be a main topic, which is one of these seven. And then we kind of conclude every uh, every one of them with a lightning round. Yeah. Where you just get the, the their take, their initial take uh, on all of the other mechanics. And I think that is really, it's really easy, I think, to silo your thinking into, you know, Steve and I tend to agree on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, disagree on a fair number of things. It makes but, it easy, doesn't it? Yeah. But, you know, we're talking about uh, something like free, which we'll do a whole lot, an entire episode on. But the... I think in general, we, we on these seven particularly, we tend to agree about these kind of things. But then hearing the lightning round for each designer, and they come from very different backgrounds. So you listed the names, but uh, just for people that may not be aware of all these people, MJ Newman, uh, Arkham Horror LCG particularly, as well mm -hmm. as a slew of other FFG titles. You've done a lot with Marvel Champions recently mm -hmm. as well. Lucas Litzinger, uh, designer of Star Wars Destiny, uh, also Netrunner at the LCG, doing yeah. the update and bringing that back to life, is now over at Wizards of the Coast working on a uh, really cool project. He'll talk about more of that in the episode. Then you have Justin Gary, uh, which is, of course, Stoneblade, Soul Forge Fusion of, of recent uh, times, but also Ascension, which is mm -hmm. a critical game in the industry. And I think the other part of this Power 7 that's worth noting before continuing down the list, and I'm reciting these from memory, so hopefully <laughs> I don't fail. I'll help but you out, yeah. the uh, reality of this is very much focused, I think, on card games. Yeah. All these designers are card game designers. Uh, that is the area that Steven and I have spent the most time in and most interested in versus like miniatures or role-playing games or even board games. Uh, so it is kind of cool, like talking to Justin, Ascension, very much a deck building style game. So it's a kind of a card game, but also mm -hmm. I think board game genre games can play by slightly different rules sometimes. Uh, and a lot of the stuff we talk about is specifically when it comes to card-based games that expand over time. Yeah, uh, But it is cool. You have MJ on Arkham, which is cooperative, all the way to competitive right and and there are some very different different takes on that and let's not forget justin was a magic the gathering pro tour you cannot forget. person Must so has forget. some ideas and then we also got isaac vega and nick conley um isaac the original designer of ashes and that does a lot of different things as it relates to like resource cards and mana mm -hmm. switching those out to the dice and making sure you have 10 to spend every turn um and then nick having taken that over and having revamped and honestly uh, streamlined and fixed a lot of the Power 7 issues, I think, that were in Ashes to begin with and has uh, now kind of taken the reins on that. And so hearing his take on something versus Isaac's take on something, Isaac now uh, on Rose Gauntlet started his own studio, has made a game and has a lot more in the works. Uh, so hearing his take on that, that kind of stuff is also going to be fascinating, of course. And then who can forget Alex Davey? Yep. I mean, Which, Alex is just one of my favorites, <laughs> Star uh, Star Wars X-Wing, Star Wars Legion, and now over at WizKids. Just who 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 could not want to hear Alex just rail or ramble about something for at for least sure. an hour? That's one of my favorite things. Get Alex spun yeah. up about something uh, over lunch and then just listen to him go. And he, he has an extensive history as a card game player, uh, yeah. going all the way back to Magic and stuff as a kid, but... On top of that is he is more miniature leaning, which is a cool perspective to get. Uh, some of these, uh, the the lightning round for him will probably be very interesting mm -hmm. uh, because some of these concepts apply to all kinds of games. And I think any of these games, you even I think about resource curves and free as an example, um, which anytime you have a cost associated with an effect in a game, and sometimes the cost is resources. Other times, you know, picturing a game like Soulforge, there are no resource costs. Yeah, the cost is an action, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and so anything is a Star Wars Destiny, right? There are resource costs, but there are also time-based costs in the action reaction window. And so you know, it you dive into a lot of the nuance. What does free even mean? Uh, a lot, a lot to uncover. And historically, for us, we've played a lot of games that have eventually fallen off the rails. Mm -hmm. And these are the seven mechanics that almost inevitably are the thing that result in bans or restrictions or unfun game states or unfun metas Meta and games, all that kind yeah. of stuff. Well, let's start uh, running them down. I'm just going to, again, I'll go in the same order that I did. And this is kind of in the, the order that we recorded the interviews. So it's not necessarily the order we'll post them. Um, but kicking it off with just a basic summary of Limit 1, which is one of our, our Power 7. So Limit 1 rears its head... Um, actually more often than than I would think as a balancing mechanic. And this is the, the general idea here is that I have a, a card that is particularly powerful and maybe a little bit above the curve. And what is going to make it okay in the long run is that I'm just going to make sure players see it less often. And so they'll do this by saying, well, you can only have one of them in your deck. So because you won't see it as often, it's okay for it to be a little stronger. Now, there are some times where this mechanic is used as a flavorful thing. Actually, I think the Shards and Netrunner did this pretty well. Um, and the idea isn't that they're particularly strong, but just that they're particularly interesting, valuable, unique in the lore of the universe. Like the One Ring, for instance, would be a good limit one kind of card. Yeah. But you also see it in other directions. Um, and I brought up Warhammer Conquest as an old LCG that, that did this in spades. And the MO of that game was that every Warlord had a signature card pool and in that card pool was a limit one attachment a limit one like location and it was like their unique stuff that made them particularly uh flavorful and thematic the problem of course in limit one that we recognize is that if powerful cards are limited to one of in your deck then it just means that everything gets swingier the games where you see that one of is really good for you the games that you don't see the one of maybe it's really bad for you because you can't be built around it or those kinds of things um so it's we come into it i think with an idea that like this probably shouldn't happen <laughs> like it just shouldn't be used but then uh we talked to mj newman about it and uh maybe change your minds a little bit and maybe co-op is quite a bit different on yeah. this front i think both those things are true to an extent but at the same time I think strictly as a, the, the question would be, if you're balancing based on randomness, then are you actually balancing at all? Yeah. And especially in Conquest is the biggest sin of this that I, it's the most notable one that did this, which is the, there were exceptionally powerful pieces both players had access to one of. It wasn't like, it, you know, if, if there was a game where all cards were limit one of, mm -hmm. and then which cards you get, are really relevant in terms of what your how the game goes, but uh, when it's very when most cards are three of or four of, and then there's just one, um, and you know other games could get around it like Ashes first five you pick your opening hand, so limit one means you can only ever have one out, but you can also always start with it. Mm -hmm. So there's not actually a consistency randomness thing going on, uh, but it definitely different. NBA brings a very different take to the table, which is cool to hear. Yeah, and I wanted to. Pull this into uh, like the most recent game here, Sorcery, right? Like Sorcery mm -hmm. TCG, I think it's a good uh, just kind of framing mechanism for Limit 1 where they have a rarity tier that is determining the consistency of a card in your deck, right? It's like the really rare and presumably strong things are Limit 1 naturally mm -hmm. and then the step down is Limit 2, step down is Limit 3. Um, how does it, how do you think this plays in a game like Sorcery TCG differently than it might play in a game like Netrunner or Magic or even uh, Flesh and Blood? Well, I think the in Sorcery, there are a number of powerful cards that are limit one. And so it, it's about density. The If you have a 60 card deck in uh, Conquest, you have a, I think it was a 60 card deck and you have a limit, a one, one of card. Mm -hmm. And you, you only see so many of your cards every game. So, in that scenario, it was like, well, when I have it and you don't have it, I have a way easy path to victory. When you have it and I don't, same thing. When we both have it or neither of us have it, it's a fun game or it's a fair, mm -hmm. closer game. Uh, but in the sorcery reality, and uh, Soulforge is an interesting example of this too, but sorcery, 
okay, if you have a 60 card deck, but 10 of your cards are one of cards, then it's really not about randomness of power level, it's randomness of effect. So you have to build your deck entirely differently, where you are essentially, no matter which of these things that you see, and you do not see anywhere near all your cards in that game. Yeah. Uh, it's not whether or not you're going to see one. It's just which one <laughs> are, or which ones are you going to see. And that actually introduces a variance across the board that uh, fundamentally changes, I think, how you even approach playing the game, where it's so unreliable for both players. Um, that And the other thing is about the resource curve. Even if I draw that really powerful thing, the structure of the game itself, I think, makes it challenging for me seeing that one thing early to actually affect the game in in a way that is unmanageable. But Conquest was just so explicitly, usually a card you could play on turn one if you had it. And if you did play it on turn one, and the, the vibe of that game too was a snowball mm -hmm. inherently. So the <laughs> earlier you see your critical piece, the more of an advantage, even if your opponent does end up seeing it, if they see it on the last turn of the game, it doesn't matter. Yeah. You created such an advantage. But Soul Forge is also approaching this really interesting. Every card is one of. Mm -hmm. You upgrade a card, and then the next cycle you can see it. But every time you go through the deck, every card in your deck that you've brought to the table is only one of. And Which effectively means nothing. Yep. Because it's as consistent as if it was two or three or four. Right. right? It's just pure consistency. Yeah. But if, if you had, uh, in most games where you have a scenario... Of, you have four of every card, but some of the cards you only have one of. Now you're back to introducing that same same variability. I think I think the there are ways to use limit one of that are useful, but ba strictly in terms of balance, that's the question to be mm -hmm. asked. Is like if you had a card that you were a designer, you'd made four of. You made it where you could play four of it, like a normal card or three or whatever the game is. If you ever had the thought, this is really crazy powerful let's not tone it down. Let's actually just make it where you only get one. Mm -hmm. uh, that is where I think the trouble starts. And we've seen games do this exact yeah. thing. It's like really crazy, powerful effect, limit one, mm -hmm. but nothing about the rest of the game plays to a limit one reality. Yeah. And I would even say in sorcery, like if, if the complaint is this makes games too swingy and that sometimes you do a random powerful thing that is unfair, like I think sorcery is actually wanting that to happen. Like, welcome to magic, By right? Design. Welcome to wizards. It's like you could be like on top and then suddenly they conjure up the most insane spell you've ever seen. Yeah. And and you have, I think you have to build a culture around the game to make that a fun moment rather than a disappointing moment. It's all in framing. And I think they are actually doing a really good job of like, hey, yeah, we're, we're not looking to be the next like super high-end Grand Prix 10K best player going to win kind of thing. Sure. It's like we're looking to wing some insane effects. And if you're good at managing your board state and your game of sorts, you're going to win most of your matches. But sometimes wizards do wizard stuff yeah. and you get wrecked. Well, and, you know, I, I would be curious to know if you're out there listening, I would love to have you hop on the Discord and share as much. But the if you were playing a game, even not in a Grand Prix competitive pro tour level, how often you could play a game. And, you know, I think the the underlying agreement of any given game is that we're both here, presumably, uh, to play a game, and part of a game's existence is we're both trying to win on some level. If it's head-to-head, -head, if it's cooperative, it's a different kind of a thing. But, you know, if you're playing dodgeball, it's like if the other side's actually not even trying to win, it's not that fun, right? Or if you're playing, insert name of anything competitive here. Um, so the how often a game can truly just come down to you had this random crazy powerful effect. I, we played this whole game. You know, I picture some, I play board games that are kind of like this. You get three hours in and then it kind of comes down to someone just having a YOLO moment. Yeah, sure. And it's like, well, wait a second. Like, <laughs> it, and that, that could be fun. It also could not be fun. And if it isn't fun for people to do that, then that's where it gets into trouble. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be curious to play a lot more sorcery to figure out if that's the case. Because yeah. I, I kind of have a feeling that you, you're playing into the reality that the late game is just going to be knockout punch after knockout punch yeah. and you got to get ready you're like getting ready for that the whole game and then it's like all right let's see what happens um moving on denial one of the the power seven so we're we're looking at prevention and cancels primarily in this and th this is i i've been describing denial effects as anything that makes your opponent's ability to play worse or less possible as opposed to making your own game plan better um so we've seen this in pretty much every game you can imagine there's there's some level of 
prevention and or cancels that's going on most explicitly in in one of the early games like game of thrones we Mm -hmm. saw this all the time i mean the the amount of cards that simply said cancel what your opponent wants to do is tremendous and then uh, all the way up to a game like ashes where you have prevent damage you have uh, golden veil cancels an effect that that somebody's trying to do to you and so the question kind of becomes like what is the role of denial effects in a game in its presentation of a fun experience where I'm now making my opponent worse than making me better? And is that ever fun? Is that ever the right thing to do? And why do these effects need to exist at all? I think is the the question that we pose. And that's a great conversation uh, with Nick on those kinds of, uh, those kinds of effects specifically. Um, anything else on denial? I mean, that's pretty straightforward. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just a, it's a lever. Um, and I think it's really good, and we get into it in, in that episode, but good to ask the question, does this need to exist at all? Mm-hmm. What, what is the case for this existing? And then uh, I'm presently of the mind that it, it, it existing is good ultimately, but also if the lever goes too far and, and you can exist in only that capacity, uh, I just don't have fun playing against that kind of a thing. Right. And it's also in a weird context thinking about that uh, Guardians box for Marvel Champions. Uh, we always describe it as, it feels like we're playing against a control player because it just is constantly, If ironically in that case, it gave you a really cool tool in the Milano <laughs> and then it constantly just took that away from you. Yeah. Uh, which felt like it was defeating the purpose. But it in a game where you're supposed to be a superhero, that whole campaign felt like, you weren't even getting to be a superhero. You were just yeah. lucky to be making it out. You're trying to get through the slog. Yeah. Effectively. And it's it's one thing to feel like a hero and still lose. That's mm-hmm. a challenge, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, well, I need to be more awesome. But when you don't even get to feel like you're awesome, uh, and that's what happens in competitive games too. You have this concept, you've been stewing on this deck, you have this plan you want to execute, you get halfway into it, and then you realize like, your opponent is just not allowing it to happen. Yeah. <laughs> not, and, you know, not sometimes you miss and i think not being able to count on your plan working all the time is good but if it's if that's the only thing they're doing that can get really frustrating yeah totally denial weird especially relevant to you because we got we've just got uprising spoilers for flesh and blood the next set and we saw recently we introduced a lot of ice and frost mechanics where it became harder and harder to pay for your cards or do things on your turn now we've got a freeze mechanic introduced to the game where like all of your stuff becomes unusable. So it's a great time to, to uncork denial. Uh, moving on, we've got recursion. Mm. I think this is a, I, this may be like the, the, the star at the top of the Christmas tree on this series. But recursion to me is the most easily appreciable and kind of every player probably hears the word recursion and knows the problematic nature that that mechanic has presented at some point in a game that you've played in the past. And this is simply the idea that you can have a card that enters play, does a thing, and then can somehow interplay again, generally through pulling it out of the discard pile, playing it directly from the discard pile, some kind of a banish mechanic that uses it a second time, or even the ability to shuffle it back into your deck. Um, And (laughs) <laughs> we got a chance to talk to Lucas about this because how couldn't you? I uh, had a, some great conversation <laughs> history there. about recursion and, and we get into that in the episode. But yeah, so this is recursion. It's the ability that for effects to continually happen over and over again. And I, I, can't, I can't cite enough instances of this in games that have happened from Netrunner, Deja Vu, Parasite, or, you know, putting things, uh, destroying ice over and over again. Account Siphon Recursion and Netrunner was some of the degenerate stuff that I was particularly doing in that game. Um, all the way to, uh, what was it? What's a good, oh, actually a recent example of Flesh and Blood, Drenner Brutality, got banned because simply it recurred over and over again. Um, anything else that, that, can you remember? Was Star Wars Destiny had the Millennium Falcon loop, yep. right? Yeah, and that's a classic. Every kind of continual busted <laughs> loop. And, you know, just the reality, again, it kind of comes back to the cost conversation. One of the costs of playing a card is that it's played yeah. and then it is going to go away usually to a discard pile and then you're not going to see it again. Uh, once you introduce recursion, you're breaking that cost out and it's also kind of combo tutor because you're also getting to a lot of times choose the card from your discard pile that yeah. you're bringing back. And so I think with a lot of all these in general, it's it's almost like any vice uh, where in moderation, it won't won't usually kill you, but yeah. too much of it. And I think everyone, and not everyone, I think a lot of people who play card games for a long time have had moments in games where you start playing someone and they start playing basically from their discard pile. Yeah. 
And that's a lot, you know, it can be fun, especially if you have like some undead hero or like, you know, bring it back from the dead, that vibe. Mm -hmm. But it also just creates so many problems in the end. Um, So I've seen some good, good uses of this though. I think so far Flesh and Blood has used this well, where there's a touch of it. It's usually pretty restrictive. It, It costs a decent amount to make it happen. Um, and, but they're start they're playing with fire in this new set, you know, like yep. those cards that in the discard pile have an ability you can use, mm-hmm. uh, which is not quite the same as recursion, but it's close. It is close. Yeah. And even it's worth noting, like our, the original, I think insane, uh, exciting deck that we built for spoils was all about gold. This, uh, was it gold rush, gold, gold summit, gold summit. <laughs> And Rid of Reclamation, which was a card that basically you put the top through three cards from your discard pile on the top of your deck, something like that. And then we would put the three on the top and then we would draw the three and there was a three card combo we could do that would put the three back in and you get Rit back. You get Rid of Reclamation and two other cards and then you play them. You get Rid of Reclamation, two other cards, play it, and you could just keep cycling it forever. And so you get to an in-game state where everything was in your discard pile and the three you would put back in were always the three you were drawing, and it was just busted. Yeah. Uh, Gold Summit was gaining life every time. Yeah. Which is the not lose situation. Rit is you actually pick a number for X that is less, three or less, remove that many cards from a discard pile from the game, pick X other cards in your discard pile, shuffle them into your deck, and draw a card. Yeah. So you, you can only do it for so long. Mm-hmm. But like if you ran a 100 card deck, you because this doesn't banish itself or whatever. Yeah. So like you, you could get these back with this, and it draws you a card. The other one was the uh, gl- some gluttony. Yeah, I remember that. Selective yeah, yeah. gluttony. Maybe? Selective gluttony is what it was called. It's yeah. Like draw ten, discard nine. Yeah. So if you have two of the things out to gain your life for every card you draw, you draw ten, gain twenty, discard nine. Then now you have a bunch of cards in your discard pile to use this with. Um, yeah, it was pretty degenerate. And the whole thing was don't die while you essentially deck yourself and then use her to reclamation to just continually destroy. It, it's funny seeing that card now because I see it and I'm just like, I can't. <laughs> I, I actually would kind of low-key love, I wish I could go experience spoils again with yeah. the experience I now have. Because uh-huh. that took months of really trying to figure out how to get it to kind of function. Um, and then we finally did. But that see, was such an exciting moment, though, yeah. when you figured out, like, oh, my gosh, I can get to this state where, like, I can do yeah. something insane. And, and nobody you're just like, else I found don't know it. how I'm going to win. Nobody ever. else found it. It was yeah. so awesome. I love games like that. Uh, Moving on, we've got the memory tax and Mm. I got a good conversation with Justin about this. So I've seen this really in uh, particularly the throwbacks and a lot of the older games. And it feels like modern design has gotten more and more away from this idea of an insurmountable amount of information that you need to parse on the board and more of a cutting through and allowing the kind of the base foundation of a, a tactical decision that is satisfying to live at the front of the game engine rather than buried under a lot of information that you have to remember. But examples of like this memory tax uh, stuff is like even even one of the originals, Magic the Gathering, right? You have a board state that can be infinitely large. Mm-hmm. And so you can have 50 plus things on the board and how do you attack into that? How do you deal with that? Game of Thrones did this uh, as well, had no board limit. There were a lot of board states that were just obnoxious in that game. The three challenges and how do I, if they do that, then we do that. And it got so big and so much to remember and so much floating information that you didn't feel like you could actually make a satisfying decision. Like you would have to put it through a computer to, to figure out the ideal outcome. And then you add secret information in the form of a hand to these impossible decisions and it just becomes untenable. We also seen this in games that have plus one. We decide this all the time. Lord of the Rings, plus one to all your dwarves, plus one yeah. to all of your hobbits, plus two if your dwarf has an item, plus one on the item itself. I mean, Star Wars CCG is probably the <laughs> it's, it's the, the premier. Idea. Decipher loved this. The yeah. uh, I, I I just I cite this example often, but a local player, Matt Ziga, who plays that game after we streamed it the first time before the pandemic, I was playing with him in the store. And, uh, you know, we were going and we had these, uh, our tables what, you know, playing. And then I just remember so distinctly, I knew I had an effect that affected like my scouts or mm-hmm. something somewhere on the table. And I was just like parsing through, like shuffling through my cards on the table to try to find in all these bricks of text, this effect. Yeah. Uh, and it's easy to forget that kind of stuff. But the, uh, to me, the equation is actually pretty simple and everyone has a different, tolerance level for this some people love very technical remember all these minute pieces that are in play 
uh, and how they function, but what percentage of the energy am I using in my brain to track what's happening and execute successfully based on the rules, what should be happening yeah. versus what percentage am I actually using to make meaningful decisions? For me, the more that I'm actually making meaningful decisions, the more satisfying that experience is. Even though like I, I, flesh and blood now, realizing all the different nuances depend on your class and what hero you are and what hero you're playing against. And there's so many techni technical pieces. And it is satisfying to an extent mm -hmm. to operate a deck and technically execute the game well from that way. I, Middle Earth CCG, Star Wars CCG to me, Winning or losing is less relevant than getting done and feeling like I executed the game well. Yeah. But at the same time, if you have too much of that, it just feels like a chore to, to play the game. And like I said, it's different for every person. I mean, there's a ton of different games. Like I think of some of those big miniature games that Mech, is it Mech Warrior? What's the Mech? Battletech. Battletech. Yeah. Where it's like every finger in your hand has a stat and like, mm -hmm. not technically that <laughs> crazy, but it's like, it's a lot to manage, right? And you, you know, your missile hit me in the left side chest plate near mm -hmm. my, it's like, whew, there's a lot going on. And it can also be awesome. I mean, totally. We loved that, yeah, yeah. you know, we loved that at the same time, but th there's, there's times when that amount of information is contributing positively to the experience that you're wanting to create in the game. And there's times that it just seems like it's laying on top of the fundamental decision tree in your game and it isn't really enhanced too much by it. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's why we've seen a lot of the modern games get away from that. And I, I think a, a ways this eventually goes really wrong for a lot of games is that they don't start this way. Yeah. So like start like a raw deal that we played. Mm -hmm. um, we played with modern day decks that someone lent us. And it was like, before we even started, there were like 10 effects on the board we had to be paying attention to. And everyone said like, that's not where the game started. Yeah. And the the reason it goes off the rails in general is that if it starts at one layer, and this is true for a lot of this, the game, you know, think about control. The game may not have very many control effects up front, but then you get four years in and you print a couple control cards every set. And eventually someone can just play the, I'm running all control effects there. Yeah. yeah. And then suddenly the game plays a lot differently than what you bought into in year one or day one. And uh, that that creates a lot of trap. Memory tax is exactly the same way, which is like a lot of times people will fix games with these other things. It fixes in air quotes here. And it will eventually spin out into a memory tax problem. Yeah. Because there's just too many things to try to keep track of. Yeah. This fixes that. That counters that. And we start in play with this and all my dragons are this and they can't be destroyed by these effects. We even saw this recently in uh, Wheel of Time. Mm -hmm. Like I had a ton of information that was like all of your warriors of this type can't do this thing where they usually could do it because there's this uh, starting character that has Something these abilities. Something the sun or yeah, yeah, exactly. whole thing. Uh, moving on, we've got resource cards. The idea, and this is just simply, we, we've talked about as resource cards and resource curves, but it, it's really it's really the card element of it where you are drawing into the resources you need to keep your uh, game plan moving forward. And so, the, you know, the, the ultimate uh, arbiter of this in the early days is magic, having land in the deck. How many times have you heard about magic and mana screw, mana flood, etc.? cetera? Um, there's an element of this that is having agendas in deck for Netrunner. They're not resource cards per se, but it creates a similar kind of problem where you might draw all of a thing that isn't actually the cards that you're wanting or needing to play. And so now suddenly like the game gets a little different, mm -hmm. a little weird. It can be exhilarating in Netrunner. But in Magic, it's just very difficult to play out of that yeah. a lot of the time. And so what inevitably happens, which we've talked about many times, is that either you don't get the cards that you need to actually have a decent game with your opponent, very similar to the limit one mechanic. Mm -hmm. If you're both in this situation, it's fine. If you're if you're both not in it, it's fine. If one person is, it's bad. And then also just cards that come out and, and improve your, your economy. Right, we saw this in Game of Thrones all the time. I was gonna say Game of Thrones and Conquest LCGs are mid ground examples of this. Yeah, which is there's a certain amount of resources happening either way, but too many of the resource cards, same problem you have in Magic. Too little versus your opponent having enough, also an un unclosable gap, so yeah. to speak. And we've seen again in, in modern game design, there's a lot of movement away from this. I mean, Ashes is the obvious example that still has resources of a kind. 
But then you look at even Keyforge, just play, choose a yep. house, play the cards. You look at Soulforge Fusion, play the cards. You look at Flesh and Blood. It's like every card is a resource instead yeah. of having cards that just are just that resources. Are just resources, yeah. And then you look at Sorcery, and like they have a separate resource deck, mm -hmm. and you only draw resource cards, land cards when you want to, and you know they will be resources. Yep. We even saw this in Spoils, where you can start to use any card as a face down resource as an answer to what they thought was the greatest problem with Magic at the time. Yeah. Um, so it's a fascinating discussion. Isaac Vega is going to be joining us for that and uh, great, great conversations to be had there. And then uh, lastly, uh, well, at least of the guest appearances, we've got Silver Bullets, Silver Bullet cards. And this is very, you know, everyone probably has a different threshold for what they might consider a Silver Bullet. But for our case, it's really a very specific answer to a very specific problem or a very specific card. A um, good example of this is Plascrete Carapace and Scorch and Earth when it comes to Netrunner. Um, other examples of this throughout my I mean, uh, life. The one that came to my mind immediately was King Robert's Host. Oh, man. Can't do so, power challenges yeah, in Thrones. In Thrones, there's three main challenges that you can play the game as. And there were three different units, armies you could put into play that just stop your opponent from doing one of the three. Mm -hmm. And you had to play a specific house, but uh, it essentially meant you could shut them out of that lane uh, unless they had very specific answers. But other other kind of examples would be uh, Flesh and Blood as an example right now, uh, a silver bullet, if you're destroying items, is probably just an anti-mechanologist card. Yeah. There, yeah. Every uh, class could run an item, <laughs> but the only ones that really do and also benefit from it. So like we got a card smashing good time in this last set. It means if, if an attack hits this round, you blow up an item. Yeah. And it's like that. That's kind of a silver bullet. It, it has a wider Tighter eventual. Too, which is cool. Yeah, yeah. It has a wider eventual. But, you, you know, you see this all the time. It's like the opponent can't play dragons. Mm -hmm. Or kill a dragon. And it's yeah. like, well, if, you, if you're playing dragons, this is a problem. Or in Lord of the Rings, kill Aragorn, son of such and such, yep. if there's an equipment on it. Like, it's like, it's like, oh, this was too good in our game. Yeah. So we're going to release a card that everybody can play. Lord of the Rings TCG. That'll it's, kill it. This literally exists. Yeah. It's like, or like exhaust Aragorn specifically. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like, well, uh, that's, <laughs> okay. That's very, I mean, a bonus if it is happens to be Aragorn is one thing. Yeah. Even that's questionable. But yeah, silver bullets are just, and a lot of times designers, I've seen games try to design out of problems with silver bullets is the reality, yeah. which is some deck will be too popular. And it's like, well, in the next set, we're going to print a card that makes that deck way worse. Mm -hmm. Like if people just put this in their deck and uh, one of the concerns with silver bullets, of course, is eventually there's enough problems that you can't run all the silver bullets. And so then it's just a matter of, did you bring the right silver bullets and did you have the right silver bullet at the right time? And, and we did get, the meta game, were you right about the meta that yeah. you brought the right tools? And, and we get back to the similar problem with the resources, with a lot of these things. It's like, well, if you have the right answer at the right time, you win. And if you don't, you just lose. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, you could think of... Uh, Certain, there's certain effects in Ashes that kind of come to mind too that aren't necessarily silver bullets. And, and that's where you can get away with some of these effects that are obviously good against certain things. Uh, like, you know, if you're playing a big unit like Mayoni Snakes, for instance, there are certain cards that are just so good against mm -hmm. that, whether it's Fester or anything else. Um, and so you, you, can, you can say like, well, it's not explicitly answering this or that. And I think that's genuinely okay. But then you get into like Lord of the Rings TCG is, is just such a good example of this. And it's like, if an Urukai orc <laughs> is above eight power and you're at this location, make this crazy good thing for you happen. Because it's like, well, all of our games are having Urukai orcs at eight location unbeatable. So we've got to have an answer to that, right? And as you said, that's a house of cards that you just yeah. stack up because you have a fundamental issue at the bottom of it that is creating so much churn on your design. Yeah. Finally, we've got free. Which we're going to talk a whole episode about. We're going to talk a whole episode about, so we won't uh, dive into it too much here, but you don't have to use your imagination too much. It's essentially the idea that something can get around the fundamental cost that it was built around. Um, let's say you have a six-cost unit, and then you have a location, and the location says six-cost units are free to play. Maybe the six-cost, uh, maybe the location costs 10, and maybe it's very difficult to get out. 
But then if you do get it out, the cost never, almost never is uh, high enough to then suddenly skip all of these costs. And the, I mean, the, the philosophical reality here is that if a card is balanced around a certain number of costs and you remove one of those costs, that inherently is going to make the card too good. Yeah. Um, so you have to somehow balance the cost of the thing that's making the other cost free. And if you can't do that, it's, it, and you can, and can you, yeah. you know, like, I mean, is I, it even possible? I think hypothetically you could. Uh, you could have a cost that's of equivalent, basically change the cost, right? And mm -hmm. Netrunner, I think, tried to do this and kind of failed because the central reality of Netrunner, and we'll dive into this in the episode, so I don't want to go too far, but was around credits and clicks. And then at some point there was that, I think it was Mom Bad Cycle, that was like, what if instead of paying credits, you paid cards? Yeah. It's like, well, there's a bunch of cards in the game that let you draw cards for not a lot. Mm -hmm. So when I used to have to pay a bunch of money to get through this problem and now I'm just paying cards, cool conceptually, mm -hmm. but the the cost of a card is not the same as the cost of a thing. It'd be especially bad if you could then use those cards you discard to recur. Oh, them. can you imagine? You know, it's yeah. like, well, now we've got an engine that you kind of weren't yeah. expecting to happen with all those cards yeah. being printed over time. So it's, there's either limits on it or have some other cost. Like uh, in, in FAB, as an example, if you're reducing a cost, you could have to take a damage for every cost reduction that you're applying. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you can give minus 18, but it's going to cost you 18 life. Yeah, it's right. Like, well, wait a second. Is and, that feasible? And you've even got the classics in, uh, you know, like Marvel Champions, Lord of the Rings, the LCG. All these games love the effect of put something into play for a turn. Yeah. And then it goes away at the end of the turn. And it's just, it's always where you can look to say like, how busted can this get? I'll put Gandalf in for a turn, which is what it's meant for, Sneak Attack in Lord of the Rings. Um, and also in Marvel Champions uh, with Nick Fury, the Gandalf of Marvel. But it's just like, anytime you're skipping costs, just watch out. Because yeah. we, we, we know how degenerate this can ultimately get, especially if you can do it over and over and over again, which oftentimes you find ways yeah. to. And there's, like I said earlier, there's weird costs. Like Destiny, one of the costs is your action. So if you skip the cost of an action, you're fundamentally overriding the core balancing mechanics of the game. Uh, a lot more to say on that, and yeah. we will get to it when we get to that episode. Yeah, so that's the seven. That's the power seven that we've identified uh, throughout a, a lot of playing games, especially these throwbacks over the past couple of years, being able to more accurately talk about what's going on in these games, what's working, what isn't, etc. So starting next week, we will be coming at you with the Power 7. It's a pre-recorded series. We hope you'll all dig it very much. We'd love to hear further discussion, particularly in the game design channel of our Discord. I think there's a lot of good conversations to be had there, given the conversations that are going to come up in these series uh, specifically. So it's an absolute pleasure to be able to put this kind of a series on. Um, we can invest the time to do these kinds of things because we have so many folks listening to the podcast and also buying products from us, subscribing to all the various releases that that folks want to play and to stay on top of. Um, so we want to continue doing these bigger kinds of series. And we hope you guys will enjoy, and we can't wait to hear your feedback on it. And notably, this is episode 200. Is this episode going on YouTube? Are we running that test here? I uh, I will... Am I publicly saying something? Say 99% reason? chance, yes, that is currently yeah, the plan. So, so we have had a lot of feedback. Uh, of course, people listening to this probably have no trouble because they're listening to it as a... Maybe they're listening on YouTube right now, and I don't know it. Probably, yeah. Um, so we're going to be at least testing that. Uh, some people didn't even know we had a podcast, which is a lot of people. That that was the re reality. A lot of people had no idea we even had this podcast. But I do want to say episode 200, that's a big episode to hit. It's crazy we've done 200 of these things. If this is a new episode for you, there are 199 other episodes that we've done over the past five years. We have now been doing this for over five years, Amazing. which is crazy. And the commentary we've received on this uh, show, whether it's reviews on iTunes, that kind of thing, which is super appreciated for anyone's gone to do that, all the way to commentary in our Discord, comments on our you know social media posts, the text messages on our texting platform, and the in-person conversations I've had referencing the podcast from people going to some of these fab events recently, really amazing. Uh, so if you if you've been out there listening to us, been along for the journey. Uh, so grateful to have you here with us and uh, for everyone that does allow us, like you were saying, through their their direct financial support through buying mm -hmm. stuff from us to to do these kinds of things, have these kind of conversations on a weekly basis. And 
particular shout out to, uh, or a particular shout out to our content members as well. Uh, a lot of them out there uh, asking for nothing and just uh, helping us do a lot of the stuff that we do. So He's putting in the hard yards, as they say. Yeah, uh, just very grateful to be here. Yeah, huge thanks to everybody. And uh, coming up, seven hot episodes of uh, the Power 7 Mechanics. Can't wait to uh, to get your feedback on this series. And until then, keep playing.